The following podcast is with Norman Erler. He's a German screenwriter, author, and journalist. Norman is most widely known as the author of Blitzed, which is this incredible book that documents the role of pervitin, which is otherwise known as methamphetamine, and other drugs during Nazi Germany and World War II. However, interestingly though, the success of Blitzed is actually just another feather in Norman's cap. For among other things, he co-wrote a movie with Wim Wenders, he's written and published novels, he's worked as a journalist extensively in the Middle East, and even published the last interview Yasser Arafat gave before his death. For me, Norman is someone who I admire deeply because of his ability throughout his career to just sort of follow his interests and tastes wherever they took him. He's never been pigeonholed down as one particular thing or another, but instead can use writing as his uh, trained craft to express himself in so many different fields. To be successful as a journalist, to be successful as a novelist, and also to be successful in nonfiction is an amazing, amazing accomplishment. Oh, and I didn't even mention to be successful as a screenwriter for a movie. So this was a really special podcast to me, uh, as you'll hear briefly. I've been trying to get in touch with Norman for a long time. But in this podcast, you can expect to hear about the moment of serendipity that led to Norman writing Blitzed in the first place, a bit about the crazy debaucherous nature of Berlin pre-World War II. There's a brief history history on drug synthesis, including heroin, cocaine, methamphetamine, and even aspirin. There's, of course, a lot about the prevalence of meth in the Nazi army, and as well, Hitler's codependency on his doctor. Norman also addresses some of the criticisms of the book, and as well, he speaks about what the overall lessons is that he hopes people take away from reading it. Now, I want to give a shout out to David de Jong, former guest on this podcast and author of Nazi Billionaires for setting this up. Norman was actually one of the first people I wrote to over three years ago as a guest for this podcast. And as I'm finding out with this thing, you know, some of the guests you most want to speak with are in fact the hardest to find. Um, I couldn't get in touch with Norman no matter how much I emailed him, DM'd him, etc. But with an introduction, that all changed. I'm so keen to speak with the likes of Colin Hay, Sebastian Salgado, and before his death as well, I was so keen to talk with Cormac McCarthy. These are guys who have just have so much value to share on a podcast, but you never see them doing them, and they are extremely hard to get in touch with, and typically, it is only via an introduction from someone they trust that it is uh, made possible at all. So, thank you, David De Jong, and as well, this is also a reflection on you, my, my dear listener, and a reflection of the network that you, me, and this podcast is together creating. So, thank you for being a part of that and for being a force of authority for when I do reach out to these people that I can say there is a guaranteed audience that are going to listen intently. And that is um, so, so amazing uh, that we've been able to create that together. So, thank you to David De Jong, and thank you to you, my my dear, dear listener. So pump that good juice into the algorithm. We're talking five stars. I was glad to see during the week that the Spotify reviews have caught up to the number of published episodes. By the time next week's episode rolls around, let's double that amount. So pump it in five stars all across the board. I hope you enjoy this podcast. And with no further ado, here is the great German Norman Erler. Norman, to start off, nothing to do with Blitzed but a very intriguing part of your biography. You co-wrote a movie with Wim Wenders. Um, was this before or after he uh, made Salt of the Earth with Sebastian Salgado? I'm not even sure. It's so long ago. I think it was, it, I think it was before, actually. Um, this was in 2000 and and nine we shot this movie so when okay. was salt of the earth yeah maybe i think salt of the earth might be 2009 too or 2011 or 12. i only asked the question to segue whether he told you any great uh sebastian sogado anecdotes or stories he did not many <laughs> other anecdotes but none about that person yeah well tell us something interesting about vim Well, he told me, for example, that he made the movie Buena Vista Social Club um, on a two-week notice. He heard he will go to Cuba in 14 days, and then he basically made the movie, like, on the spot. I thought that was quite interesting. Mm. Um, 
it was just a fun time um, seeing a very good filmmaker in action and being able to see everything mm. and uh, be part of everything. I really enjoyed it actually. Because he's a great guy, you know, he's a great artist. It's just fun to work with someone like that for two months. Um, it, it is interesting. You seem to have had like a, an eclectic writing career because you have this um, film credit. You are a novelist. You wrote Germany's first hypertext novel. I don't know what that is. Um, the you've also first hypertext been novel. and are a journalist. The world's first hypertext novel. What is hypertext? Well, hypertext is um, a linked text. So uh, when the internet or the web first, you know, came up in the early to mid nineties, it was the idea that a text does not necessarily have to start on the first page and end on the last page, but that there would be, you know, clickable words or phrases that would transport you into another file. And uh, so the text becomes more spatial. And I thought at the time that this was interesting, um, an interesting format for, for a detective novel. So my first uh, novel, which is a detective mm -hmm. novel, ah. was first published online by yeah. myself in 1995 with a clickable map of Manhattan. And you could, you know, access the story at different points and therefore come to different conclusions. That was kind of the idea. And uh, it was like a literary experiment. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but I think it really emphasizes the sort of um, um, inference I'm trying to make um, as well that we didn't mention just then. You published the last interview Yasser Arafat gave shortly before his death. Blitz does a historical work. I, I get the sense that you've just managed to follow your interests over time and allow that to direct you? I guess there are some writers who always write the same book and they become real masters in it. And there's absolutely, you know, that's absolutely uh, okay. Uh, but I just happen to not be such a writer. My books are, I guess every book is, a, is, a, is an experiment for me. In a way, I'm an experimental writer or I'm an I'm an art. I, I see myself as an artist, basically, who uses words because I'm. I, I'm I just can't paint, but um, I can write. So every book is like an art project, and that's why also my books have different styles. Um, there's not. There's. I, I mean, maybe the styles become more. Uh, uh, maybe the style kind of finds itself by now but at least in the last 25 years every book is, is wildly different not only in content but also in style because the style is uh, every content somehow determines the style at least for me um, so I'm quite open to new subjects and experiments like after I published Blitzed which is about drugs in Nazi Germany I wrote a historical novel which was set in the 18th century i mean it doesn't really make sense why you jump from one to the other but for me it made per perfect sense because i just <laughs> was interested in this rather boring uh, uh 18th century story after the most uh unboring story in the world which is hitler on drugs but i think that's the freedom that literature mm. actually gives you you can just um it's a very free art form actually you said that you're uh you're an artist who can't paint. What do you think is the greatest sort of artistic achievement in, in, in the written form? If that's not too sappy of the a question form? to ask. Yeah. Artistically, mm. what is the highest achievement of writing that, that you're familiar with? It's I obviously mean, a subjective it's, opinion. It's, it's probably boring to answer Shakespeare, but I mean, I've only discovered like 1% of what this entity produced because it's so dense and so vast so I, I i'm not really an expert at all but somehow i think that i could probably just read shakespeare for five years and not get bored and you probably won't find a lot of entities or authors like that um i mean when i was younger i was i was really fascinated by quite a lot of authors like also kafka 
for example, or other German poet like Rilke. Uh, but since I am writing myself now, I find less and less time to really read because writing is so time consuming. And especially when you write nonfiction, which I do once in a while, you, you tend to focus to read in your subject that you're working on. And then as soon as that's yeah. done, the new project comes along. So I've kind of lost touch with literature being a writer, which sounds ridiculous, but it kind of happened along the way. Um, <laughs> but there's new stuff that I could discover, I think, if I would focus on reading again, I think there's a lot of amazing things, you know, not just Shakespeare. What was the moment of serendipity that led you down the avenue that became blitzed? Since you did have such eclectic tastes and wanted to try something different all the time, you know, what was the moment where the idea of this as a story and a book uh, became was presented to you? It was presented to me by a friend of mine who was a DJ in Berlin's underground club, Club of Visionaries. His name is Alex. Um, and he said, this was in 2010, when I asked him what should I write about now, he said you should write about Nazis and drugs, which I thought was a ridiculous <laughs> idea because, you know, I have been taught a lot about Nazis being German in school and through my you know, grandparents and parents and drugs was never, never mentioned, you know. Uh, we all know about the evils of Nazi Germany, um, but also it was always portrayed as a system of discipline and order. I mean, that is basically Nazi propaganda that we still believed in that at least, you know, not at least, I mean, it was brutal and mass murderous, but there was like an order to it and it was disciplined. And so this kind of, contradicts the idea that everyone in Nazi Germany was taking drugs. I mean, it just that doesn't make sense. So, uh, but after researching like a little bit online and then speaking to a medical historian who actually confirmed that the German army was using uh, methamphetamine, I became quite interested in it, in the topic, because I always wanted to write a book about the about the Nazi times, and, but I never knew which book that should be because every book has been written on the subject. And I always found drugs extremely fascinating uh, as a topic. So combining the two was alluring. And then, I mean, combining the two, knowing or researching that actually there is such a true uh, uh, such a such a true such a such a valid reason for researching this. Then became very fascinating, and uh, at one point I was sitting in the Federal Archives of Germany, r reading the original um, notebook of uh, Theo Morell, the personal physician of Hitler. I mean, I had this thing in my hand, which was kind of fascinating, because it was this actual notebook with handwritten notes, and I wrote like what he gave Hitler and when I read certain sentences, like uh, it was immediately clear that this is a, a big, big story that for some reason no one's ever really discovered and examined. So I had kind of a, I had kind of something on my hands there in the archive, and it was quite exciting. Um, you you mentioned early on in the book, I forget who the person was, but there was a um, there's been as you said every angle of Nazi Germany attacked um, and written about and uncovered, yet the personal physician of Hitler in one of his biographies was mentioned something like only seven times, um, and the idea of Hitler being, um, and let alone the rest of the uh, Nazis being dependent, if not addicted to pervitin and these other methamphetamines and drugs, um, uh, never came up. So is that because they didn't have access to this sort of... Um, sort of smoking gun that you found in the in the German archives. How do you give an explanation for that in hindsight that no one else managed to discover and therefore write about this um, detail? Well, Nazi Germany is a very serious topic because it's connected to the genocide um, against the Jews and connected with 50 million dead people in World War II. Um, 
so that led historians to a very you know, cons conservative, maybe uh, conscientious research. Uh, and I spoke to a leading historian who was kind of a mentor for me for the book, Hans Mommsen, who passed away by now. He was an older gentleman who basically knew everything about National Socialism. But he'd never concerned himself with drugs. And when I found, when I showed him all the copies I'd made in the archives, he just was, he was blown away. And he said, well, we historians, mm. we just don't know anything about drugs because they don't take drugs. Historians, they, at least maybe now they do, but, you know, a few decades ago, the, the, <laughs> the main historians who, who, you know, examine national socialism, they, they, they live in a glass tower or an ivory tower not in you know contemporary berlin in the club scene like i used to uh 20 years ago or 10 years ago so drugs they don't know what drugs are uh, most people don't know what drugs are except people who use them themselves or have some kind of personal relationship to them uh so no one like for example i also didn't know what it meant when i read the notes of morel that hitler received 20 milligrams of oikodal intravenously. I read that and I had no idea what that meant. And I didn't take it seriously. And then I showed it to the same DJ that uh, brought me to the topic in the first place. And he said, are you insane? You don't know what this means? Oikodal is a very strong euphoric making opioid, which it is, you know, he immediately recognized it because he had taken it himself. So he said 20 milligrams intravenously mm. That is like the strongest possible dose that you can, you know, still, you know, stomach and, 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 and so, so that changed my perspective. And I guess historians didn't have that access. I mean, so historians were not really, they didn't have the toolkit to um, evaluate this particular topic. So it was left to an outsider, basically, which was mm. me. Um, this is the explanation. I love it. And I can totally map onto why that, uh, why that makes sense as a potential reason why there's been that oversight as well. And in response to, um, the criticism of the book, I didn't necessarily, I thought that it was such a weak commentary because it was sort of saying that because the Nazis were under the influence of the drugs, that it's somehow excusing the way that they behaved. And it's like, are you kidding me? What a horrible thing to say. Like someone is excused of their behavior just because they got high. Are you crazy? So I could not um, understand oh. necessarily why that was even ever taken seriously yeah, as, as, as that... a type of criticism. It was only taken seriously because the guy who wrote it is a famous historian, Richard Evans, but his basically his criticism was full of shit. It was it doesn't stand up at all. It's ridiculous. <laughs> I mean, my yeah. father, for example, is a very high, was a very high judge in Germany, and just from a judicial standpoint, if you're high and you commit a crime, it's not that you're not excused, you know. Um, no, and I didn't excuse. I didn't excuse the Nazis uh, at all. I just painted a more exact uh, picture. This was basically jealousy by historians. Uh, they had to find something against my uh, my work. Um, but you know, it's 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 uh, that yeah, it's it is jealousy actually. It's a uh, it's a it's a it's a it's a small field of Hitler experts, and uh, they want to protect <laughs> their. Um, their claims yeah. and it's 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 rather ridiculous actually but i guess the, that's the academic world also that's why they don't you know they don't think out of the box so they cannot really appreciate other historians obviously did you know there was lots of historians who said this is this is great that finally someone looked out of the box so you could also see from the reaction of the historians kind of how open-minded they are uh and some were not okay norman so to set the scene for us, I loved in the opening chapter, first you described a bit of a history of methamphetamine synthesization, but then as well, the totally debaucherous description of Berlin between World War I and World War II. So um, could you set that context for the period by starting with a brief history of methamphetamines? 
During the Weimar Republic, which lasted from the end of the First World War, 1918 to 1933, when Hitler took power, there was that was the first democracy on German ground, and uh, was a kind of chaotic, liberal, free society where experiments were you know encouraged or were just happening cultural experiments also drug experiments it was a very druggy time berlin uh, shook itself uh free from the you know the emperors uh, the emperor times with willem the second you know he was gone he was in exile he lost the war so berlin became like this famous city basically that it's somehow still is this free excessive place uh babylon berlin um so drug use was kind of rampant um you could buy all the drugs in the world for very little money so there was also a drug tourism people from england came to take drugs and have sex which they couldn't do think they, they could do things in berlin they couldn't do in london same from same 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 applies to paris or other you know european metropolis metropoli um and the Nazis always hated that because they are of a very different breed. They don't come from the big cities. The Nazis are a small town, a village, a mountain movement, basically. So urban, urban craziness is not to their liking. They branded it as Jewish and as degenerate. So they were basically enemies of the Weimar Republic. That's why they tried to bring it down and actually were successful in bringing it down. So when the Nazis took power in 33, for the first time in German history, the drug laws were strictly enforced and uh, the Nazis were proud to call themselves, a, uh, you know, a, 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 they, they tried to create a drug-free society. Um, and among the first concentration camp inmates were actually drug users. So drug Drugs were not neutral, seen as, an, as neutral anymore, but they were seen as bad. Um, so they kind of set the tone, even you know, they, they were one of the first you know, prohibitionist governments in the world. Hitler, for example, was also against smoking and he, um, he, he tried to, uh, and I think he did, install a ban on advertisement for cigarettes uh, Europe-wide once he conquered Europe. So the whole regime of the Nazis were very was very much a, a anti-drug regime which of course makes the irony even bigger that then this regime turned <laughs> exactly. out to be the greatest drug using drug abusing regime of all times um, and um, uh, if we just look at uh, methamphetamine um, it wasn't conceived or it wasn't labeled as a drug when it came out. It was just, it was just a medicine basically. So it came out in 38, it was developed in Berlin in 37 after the Olympic games, um, in 36, when, uh, there was rumor that the American athlete Jesse Owens had used Benzedrine, which was already in the, on the market in America. There were no doping, checks at these Olympic Games. So you could basically take whatever you wanted. And um, the Nazis said an Afro-American cannot be faster than an Aryan. So he must he must have been on something. So the Temmler company tried to develop a better amphetamine and developed actually methamphetamine, which is, I wouldn't say better, but it's certainly stronger. Uh, they used the um, the work that had been done in Japan already in 1917, a Japanese chemist had synthesized methamphetamine. Nagai is his name. But the Temmler company in Berlin found a new way of synthesizing methamphetamine and was therefore able to patent it and bring it onto the market as their own development. And then in 38, it became quite successful in Germany. You could just walk into any pharmacy and buy like 20 packs of methamphetamine and it was you know a good product it was clean uh it made you and the people didn't think it made you high i don't want to say it made you high it didn't really make you high it made you alert it made you awake it made you uh capable of doing your work so these were all things they were using it as a sexual stimulant as well right also but 
not mainly. I mean, mainly it was n neutral performance enhancing uh, substance. So you can use it to, to enhance your performance on all levels. And that's, that's what Nazi Germany was all about. Maybe even in the bedroom, mm. because Hitler said we need to, you know, to have a lot of sex to make a lot of you know, German babies. So everything pervitin, methamphetamine, pervitin was the brand name. Everything methamphetamine does was basically good for the Nazi, you know, ideal. The only problem was that it was a, a drug and that the Nazis had the it ideolo ideology of being a drug-free, creating a drug-free society. That's why it was not even labeled as a drug. It was just, you know, today we don't really uh, stigmatize people who drink coffee or Coca-Cola. So it was quite similar to Pavitin. It was, um, it was part of the capitalist performance-oriented society that was Nazi Germany. How do you explain the hypocrisy of the Nazi party being so Puritan? You know, they wanted to abstain from all types of drugs, cigarettes, I think even alcohol and, you know, but they excuse um, this other drug, which is clearly an external substance that changes your uh, behavior, your alertness, maybe your abilities or capacities. How do you explain the hypocrisy there? At first, it wasn't a hypocrisy because it takes a while for a society to understand what it is because there's, there had never been such a type of uh, product on the market. So it wasn't obvious that this is a drug and now we're all taking a drug even though we say we don't take drugs. So it took a while for the society to register what's going on and this was impersonated in the uh, health minister of Nazi Germany, Leo Conti. He realized it in 39, in the November of 1939, so about a, you know 18 months after the product was on the market, he introduced the prescription. He said it must, it can only be given out with a prescription. So he, he realized this is not something that anyone should be able to take all the time. Uh, but the prescription, uh, the prescription mode did not actually decrease uh, the consumption, and he became quite agitated about it. And then he thought he's the man to stop this madness. Uh, so he tried to um, really curb the consumption of pavitin, and he said this is uh, hypocritical. Uh, this, uh, especially when the German army started using it, he had, you know, angry letter exchanges with the Surgeon General of the German army saying, uh, we are superhumans, we don't need this. Uh, so there was, you know, counter reactions within the regime due to the hypocrisy. But finally, in, in the end, um, the performance enhancement or the military advantage that Pevitin gave the German soldiers, at least in the beginning, not later on, but in 1939 and 1940, it gave the German soldiers advantages. They were considered as more important than ideology. And this is, I guess, a very practical approach if you're in a war, you know, you just use whatever helps you best. You don't care about any Nazi party program that says you should not take drugs, you know, even, and, and Pervitin was not even a clear drug. It wasn't like, it wasn't, they were, it wasn't like they were using morphine or heroin or cocaine. They were using some medicine that a German company legally manufactured. So Conti had a, it wasn't easy for Conti to kind of convince the army to not take this because the army just said, this gives us an edge over our, sleepy enemies yeah. and as you go to explain it was uh, quite a significant edge um, but perhaps you could just uh, qualify for example you said you could do things in Berlin that you couldn't in London or Paris or other great um, cities um, can you really give with maybe a few examples just how sleazy Berlin was in, during this time period before the Nazis uh, took over power? I wasn't there, so I can only rely on sources. 
Uh, and I guess there's also people romanticize that period. So I guess also the hedonism it's is is maybe exaggerated, but for sure, for sure, it had a strong effect that the established uh, rule of law and of society and everything was shattered by losing uh, the first world war. So, um, traditions were, you know, destroyed. So Berlin was open to everything basically. And it had a lot of people that were desperate for, you know, anything There was people were out of work. People were addicted to drugs still from the first world war. There were many morphine addicted soldiers. So the drugs were Drugs were cheap. The, the the there was no the, the the money had no value. So, for example, for a British person, it was really cheap to come to Berlin. If he dared to like you know go there, he would be basically in paradise because his pound can buy you know so much. So, um, I guess it was just a wild night. It, it had a wild nightlife. I mean, there were lots of clubs that didn't exist anywhere else. Like. Berlin just has this a very elaborate club scene. Or it started then in the Weimar Republic, uh, very promiscuous clubs. Um, there were sex parties that you like. You walk through the center of Berlin, and you would find flyers posted on the walls inviting you to private apartments with sex parties. And I guess this was quite unusual for Europe, which was still, you know, a conservative place, but. Because in Germany everything was destroyed. Not everything was destroyed. I mean, there was no f combat in, in in Berlin. Was still totally intact. But the society, the structure, the the the, the moral, the moral was destroyed. So people had no inhibitions, I guess. What, what is it about Berlin? Because even today, a hundred years later. Um, people will still go from all over the world just to go to that city for some of the most intense nightlife uh, that you can't really see in other places. I mean, it starts there. Uh, it's a tradition um, that was especially revived in the 90s when the wall fell and lots of abandoned buildings between East and West where the wall had been standing became available for club venues. And um, the techno scene that became such a big part of the cultural you know, scene in general of the 90s had a very strong you know, base in Berlin. Very famous clubs like the Tresor started and now Berlin has the so-called best club in the world, which is the Berghain. I guess if you take away the Berghain, it wouldn't be so attractive anymore. So there's like this myth around the Berghain. Will you get in? You know, if you don't get in, you have to go to a club nearby. They will still let you in. So, yeah, I mean, it's still, it's also like a marketing tool for the city. Um, and for me, the, the city's nightlife is, to is basically over. I thought it was interesting in the 90s, in the late 90s, mid 90s. Uh, I, but that's, a, you know, because I was, that, that's just me, you know, because. Yeah, but your, I mean, your, your son, when he's, your son, when he's, you know, in his late 20s or maybe even when he's in his 50s, he's going to look back and say, yeah, I mean, when I was there, it was fun. I don't know what it's like anymore. Isn't that also something perennial? People are always like back in my days when it was really pumping. Yeah, maybe, maybe. But there is, I mean, there is a fact that the nightlife in the 90s was very special and certainly better than today. That's like for sure. But some people will say the nightlife in the 80s was even better than in the 90s. I don't know, but it certainly it certainly declined after Berlin became the official capital of Germany again, which was in the late nineties, because then the city became more gentrified, and uh, gentrification and nightlife don't go well together. Hmm. Okay, so methamphetamine was developed 
directly in response to um, a, an American athlete uh, outperforming the the Aryans in um, in the Olympics. Fascinating sort of small detail about why you know what the incentives were behind a sort of stimulant coming into the market. Then that stimulant takes on a life of its own. Obviously, that is still uh, extremely prevalent across all societies. Um, what are some of the sort of mind-blowing insights you discovered about drug development um, and the history of drugs uh, during your research for this book? Well, I wanted to start the book uh, in 1933 when Hitler takes over power and Hans Mommsen, the, the mentor I mentioned who helped me conceive the book, he said, you have, actually have to look, uh, you have to look in the past, how did the drug development actually start in Germany and I thought it was quite fascinating what I discovered there that it's basically happened in the in the second half of the 19th century when the mass society developed uh, after the French German war in 1871 there was a economic you know boom in Germany the German economy really caught on and um, there was a need in the society for for medicines basically and medicines before and, and, and then big pharmaceutical companies developed in Germany which are still big players today like Bayer. Bayer developed heroin so heroin was a product that Bayer I guess you say it in English Bayer developed heroin. Merck which is still a global player had the patent for cocaine so these companies in the last decades of the 19th century wow. had very potent uh, products um, because at the time there were no drug laws. So um, you could get heroin. It was marketed as a cough syrup um, against the flu um, for babies <laughs> so they sleep better. Jesus Christ. I mean, heroin is not really... It's not really uh, bad for your health. I mean, opium, um, the poppy plant is a, is a, is good. You know, it's, it helps you against your against pain and whatever. The only problem, obviously, is that it makes you addicted. Um, so the knowledge about the, uh, about addiction was not so developed at the time. Um, so this guy, the, his name was Hoffman. He developed heroin for the Bayer company. And 10 days earlier, he had developed aspirin. So the same guy within 10 days invents first aspirin and then heroin. Uh, so I hope he, I hope he got a promotion or something. Um, <laughs> but like the, his, his bosses were really happy, you know, so they, and they didn't know is what is what is no more lucrative. Is it aspirin against headache? Is it heroin against all kinds of flu and cold medis, uh, diseases? So this was uh, a time of innovation. Um, Germany also did not have, unlike the other European powers, important colonies, because colonies. Uh, were basically uh, created in order to import you know, spices and drugs that these colonies have, uh, which don't, you know, tea doesn't grow in England, but tea is a great drug. Um, I use it every day and um, it just gives you a little boost. So that this, this stimulate, stimulating, st the stimulant you can take like in the in the afternoon or in the morning is actually quite important if you don't have tea or coffee your day is kind of dull at least you know for most people so this is actually a big reason to have a colony and and, and but this is the same goes for spices if you don't have any spices you know it's not so much fun you know so um France, Britain, uh, Holland, Portugal, Spain, they all had colonies. Germany didn't really have them because Germany was not a nation state until, you know, that war against France in 1870, 71. And then most of the colonies were already taken. So Germany had to kind of 
uh, invent their own stimulants. That's where the pharmaceutical companies come in and invent heroin or invent, you know, patent cocaine, make it, you know, bring it onto the market. And so that's 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 why Germany became such a drugs drug place, basically. That's an incredible um, detail. So Germany synthesized meth, uh, created heroin, created cocaine. Which other of the world's great drugs are, um, and I use great in the <laughs> terms of more so like just extremely prevalent and influential, um, can Germany lay credit for? I think beer, maybe. <laughs> I don't know about that one. <laughs> Well, Germany had the first, uh, actually the first anti-drug law was the, the purity law of, I think it's 1512. It's, it was created in Bavaria. It was the law that determined what you can put into beer and what is not allowed in the beer. Because before that beer was a much more, um, a much more uh, crazy brew, like People put in like um, nightshade uh, uh, plants, which you know had str much stronger effects. Like there was beer that was hallucinogenic, and then basically the church said, "This is this is no go. This is a no go. We have to create the, the purity law." So in a way, mm. this beer, the beer that we know today, is in fact a Bavarian or a church invention that comes out of the monasteries in Bavaria. But you asked about s uh, synthetic drugs. I guess methamphetamine, cocaine, heroin are the main... Um, I mean, what other drugs are there? Um, I don't know. It, 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 there's certainly a lot of drugs coming oh, from Germany, aspirin? let's put it that way. Aspirin, yeah. Yeah. It, I mean, that's just, you know, so, so fascinating. And as well, it came from more or less, I guess, a handful of people at uh, one or two different companies. It's really, it, it's something else, you know. I mean, um, the legacy of German German industrialization or great German companies, um, it really is something else. I, as you know, you know, um, David de Jong, who wrote Nazi Billionaires, put the two of us together. Um, you know, and you look at some of the, the uh, engineering innovations that Germans did, and it does predate as well the Nazis. I think the Nazis get sort of undue credit for having all of these great scientific innovations when it was happening beforehand as well, um, like with all of these products that you just mentioned. But, um, you know, the old cliche about Germans just being really efficient engineers, um, you know, you can really see why it exists when as well you throw in like a little anecdote like that, aspirin, meth, heroin, cocaine, and potentially even beer, German inventions. Mm. and cars so we've really set the scene i think for um the role of maybe drugs in society but particularly germany now enter the nazis enter hitler can you talk a little bit about the prevalence of drugs and particularly pervitin which is this synthes this methamphetamine synthesization during world war ii um pervitin became kind of the talk of the town in Berlin in the late 30s uh, and not only in Berlin it was then also examined uh, in universities studies were being made what is methamphetamine is it good is it for what is it good because the Temla company had no clue basically what this medicine they put on the market is good for um, they just you know realized that once you are on meth you feel kind of good uh, that was basically all they could say. But the universities found out that it reduces your fear, it reduces inhibitions, um, it reduces sleep. So it has interesting effects, you know, st quite strong effects. And um, this became known to a professor in Berlin called Otto Ranke, who was the physiologist of the German army and he was looking for a way to combat fatigue and when he heard that methamphetamine does that he uh, made uh, tests with young medical officers um, 
in the in the military academy in Berlin, and uh, he found out that they actually can stay awake longer on methamphetamine, and then he tried to push this uh, with his uh, superior in order to have methamphetamine become an official drug or you know supplied officially to the troops uh, for their um for their you know campaigns and this is exactly what happened so that's how methamphetamine then became a war drug and then the prevalence of it throughout world war ii interesting fact is that the strategy that the germans used against france and against the west basically was a strategy that's based on uh, surprise and time like they knew that they could basically not win this campaign because the West had superior fighting power and more f men and also the West was trained very well the French army was supposed to be the strongest army in the world at the time the British military was also not bad you know and they combined obviously would beat the Germans um, but then tank, three tank generals had an idea to break through the Aden Mountains within three days and three nights and kind of cut off the Allies who were expecting the German attack in the north of Belgium and in the and more south in, the, in France. So in the middle where there was this mountain region, no one thought that the whole German army would go through the mountains, which is kind of a ridiculous idea. But the the army on meth actually can do that. So um, that strategy, which was very risky, um, worked with meth. So it was kind of really uh, a very unusual situation, this Western campaign, and I I really develop it in my in in my book to to figure out what actually happened, and it's quite fascinating. This military victories. It's, very unlikely but it happened there's a churchill quote um which i haven't written down but hopefully you remember it where he sort of comments on how surprised he was at the speed of the uh of the nazis was it the wehrmacht is that what they were called well the wehrmacht is the name for the german army so the wehrmacht is okay. just the army of germany the wehrmacht is not a nazi oh, no, organization it was the blitzkrieg is what it was the Blitzkrieg is kind of a nickname for this type of fast war where you surprise your enemy by gaining a lot of territory in a short amount of time and you can gain that especially if you don't stop marching at night which you usually you usually have to stop because people need to sleep but if you take a lot of methamphetamine you, you don't need to sleep um, so there was there's a quote by Guderian, who's a famous tank general. After the campaign in the West, he said to his soldiers, I asked you to stay awake for three days and three nights, and you stayed awake for 17 days and 17 nights, which I think is a bit of an exaggeration, but it shows that actually for 17 days and 17 nights, the German army did not stop. They just... They just kept going it was like something that has never happened before in military history something that the western allies were completely unprepared to you know defend themselves against so it was actually brilliant what the what the wehrmacht did um it was it worked what about that churchill quote well i mean churchill was surprised as anyone so uh you have certain uh, uh, rules for for warfare which all come from the first world war and the rules mean that at night the troops have to rest and so churchill could not understand or you know he was surprised uh, but he was quicker in his mind than the french you know generals they were very you know they didn't comprehend anything anymore you know they were just they just collapsed 
while you know Churchill was you know able to correspond somehow. But the you know the also the losses by the British military were huge in the beginning. From your research, how prevalent was Perviton subscribed and distributed across the entire army? Um, it's a little bit hard to say because there's no numbers of like, there's a total number of 35 million dosages for the Western campaign. And then you have obviously the total number of soldiers who took part, which is, I don't know, I would have to look it up in my own book, but maybe let's say 2.4 million. <clears throat> so you can kind of average it out, how many pills each, and then you can, you know, the days it took. But my research actually shows that the meth was distributed asymmetrically and was mainly or it was prioritized to the tank troops. Um, the German army was the first army ever to use the tank units as the leading units of the advance, usually in World War I. There weren't so many tanks there at all anyhow, but the tanks were like kind of like the elephants walking behind and kind of backing up the whole thing. But the Germans used the tanks like kind of like as race cars that were racing ahead and totally confusing and surprising uh, the allies. And these tank divisions, for example, the, the Rommel division, this famous tank general Rommel, who was then later fighting in Africa against Montgomery Rommel, I guess you call him in English. He was among those who received the most pavitine. So these advantageous tank generals, they like were really getting a lot of meth and taking the meth and then just speeding in their tanks and creating chaos and just, you know, gaining ground and conquering enemy territory so this this avant-garde of the tank troops they were given most of the methamphetamine so i don't think you would find a tank in this western campaign which was not high on meth like the five or four people inside who like was speeding through the, first the mountains and then the whole of France within like a few days and never slept and just, you know, fired away at everything that was in front of them. They were all high on meth. Well, this obviously created also a certain, you know, mood in this, in, in the German army. They, they kind of developed, um, it's not very nice to fight in a war you don't really want to do it. You get depressed, you get scared. But if you are if you are high on meth, it doesn't exactly turn into a party, but it turns into like an intoxicated, you know, event. So uh, it really it really helped them to do this, uh, you know, crime, commit this crime basically, because obviously it's a crime to go with weapons into, you know. A country that you know you should respect so the meth really changed their minds the details of Hitler at the end just being a total fiend um, his body shutting down such was his abuse of the various drugs what recent what what evidence do we have of the hundreds of thousands of other Nazis who were abusing these drugs how their bodies coped um, after the war and I just wonder if there's any anything you uncovered um, concerning that. The devastation in Germany during the last months of the war and then when the war ended was so great that no you know record or no examination was being done because there was no body existed that could have done such an examination also the soldiers who had taken pavitine did not really you know think about that all too much because they thought about 
different things like the horrors they had been through on the battlefield. So I think, and also you don't become physically dependent on methamphetamine really. I mean, you do to some extent, but it's not like heroin where you actually become physically addicted. So I read a study about drugs in general on the, or it was drugs on in during war, which said that many people, soldiers who, t I think it was on the Vietnam war, they take drugs during the war situation. And then once the war situation is over, they don't need the drug anymore. Um, I mean, fact is that pavitine was still around in the fifties in Germany. And I guess quite a few people took it. Um, but I never saw a statistic, um, because a lot of it was then black market. It was just like, uh, stacks that the army still had that somehow made their way to the black market and people used it or, um, but I, there's no official, the Wehrmacht, the Wehrmacht tried to, the Wehrmacht tried to set up a rehab program during the war, but they never had the funds because they, you know, used the funds for something else to buy ammunition, ammunition or whatever. So it was never really put into practice. There was a rehab program for Luftwaffe pilots, Air Force pilots. They could like take a few days off after they've taken too much pavitine and flown too many missions. But that's about it. The um, some some details about Hitler and his dependency on his doctor Morel, which really is sort of the core theme or at least storyline of the book. It's the sort of uh, it, yeah, it's the codependency of those two on each other. Uh, Morel on Hitler for status and, and, and self-worth and I suppose addiction as well. And then Hitler because uh, Morel was the first doctor who came around and um, sort of solved all of his physical ailments. Hitler seems to have been an extremely sickly person. Um, but just some details of the doctor always walking shortly behind Hitler with his bag you know, ready to administer Hitler on some upper if, you know, he basically turned around and gave him the wave to come and do it. You know, stopping a, a convoy of trains just so the needle could be administered safely into Hitler's arm. Um, little details like this add so much color to the book. But then as well, one gets a sense of sort of schadenfreude at Hitler's description of his addiction to drugs and his dependence on his doctor. And there's this vision of him itching his arm like a junkie through and through, suffering withdrawal, delusion, all the rest. So I'd just like to ask you to add color into uh, all of that and describe this codependency between Hitler and Morel. Well, you just did it. For example, how prevalent is the relationship? Give us some, some, some stats like... How often is Morel filling Hitler with various drugs? Talk about some of these crazy cocktails he was giving him, the unbelievable dosages, mm. you know, Hitler needing, um, Hitler just kind of withdrawing into madness, getting, uh, waking, uh, going to bed at 6 a.m., you know, speaking to a room for three hours <laughs> with no one responding to him. Incredible details like him with Mussolini, um, Again, maybe I'm doing it, but the give us some some color on this sort of stuff. Hitler was basically a healthy person. Um, he had stomach problems and he was farting all the time. That was like his main problem. Um, but he was he was quite fine, and he was also not so ugly as in the end. Um, he was young and and energetic, and he was a great speaker. And um, he liked his doctor in the beginning because the doctor gave him vitamins. Uh, Morel was convinced that vitamins are healthy, which I think we still believe in today. But at the time, this was kind of new. So he was kind of avant-garde with his vitamin, uh, this vitamin idea. And Hitler was a health freak. I mean, he was a vegetarian. He didn't smoke. He didn't drink coffee. So receiving injections of vitamins seemed like a natural uh, you know, thing for him. But receiving daily injections is also kind of crazy. And uh, 
and it made Hitler in a way dependent on the injection itself. So from 36, when they first met until like 41, he received daily injections. So whenever he didn't get his injection, he thought that something was missing. Um, and then he got another vitamin C, vitamin B cocktail shot. And he thought, now I will never get sick again. And he actually was, was never sick. Uh, he could, you know, s stand in his brown shirt in the rain and raise his arm for hours. So he's, he's quite fit, actually. Um, but then in 41, he was sick for the first time. This was in his headquarters, Wolf's, Wolf's Lair, in eastern Prussia against the Soviet Union. The war had just started and he had so-called Russian flu and high fever and couldn't go to the military briefing and asked Morel to give him something stronger and then Morel for the first time gave him an opioid uh, and it immediately cured Hitler's Russian flu and um, he could go to the briefing and function and Hitler was always afraid that he couldn't function anymore because he was the only one in his belief system you know that was you know necessary to keep the whole world spinning basically so it's impossible that he would not be able to function because that would, that would means that means the end of the world um, so when he realized how strong this opioid is um, Morel and him kind of developed into a couple that would you know administer not only vitamins uh, and from 41 to about 43, they still don't know exactly what's best for Hitler. But So they experiment a lot. And the vitamins are accompanied by, for example, steroids. Morel then suddenly gets very interested in steroids and develops uh, in his own pharmaceutical factory uh, hormonal concoctions of made of pig's liver and bulls, testicles, and all kinds of crazy stuff, and Hitler's really interested in them and takes them. And But these concoctions are not really healthy, so that's kind of when Hitler stops being so healthy. Um, and the whole system actually stops being, I mean, it was never healthy, but Hitler at least made decisions that worked within the National Socialist you know, belief system. But now he kind of goes off the rails, and then in '43, uh, he has this famous meeting with Mussolini, who wants to leave the war effort, and he takes Oikodal for the first time, which is now called oxycodone, and he really loves that drug because it makes him euphoric, and it numbs all his pain, so it's kind of perfect for him actually. He, whenever he takes Oikodal intravenously. He feels like Hitler again. He's on top of his game. His mental capacities are all there. He feels great. The generals can tell him that, you know, there's lots of problems on the front, but he just did, doesn't give a shit. And he just, you know, overrides them with his charisma. So Oikodal becomes his drug of choice in a way. And um, that's how he turns into a junkie, basically. So from a vitamin consuming health nut uh to a opioid shooting junkie within um well a few years it takes a few years in a, in a world war but he does change quite a bit and his health then obviously degenerates um which is also kind of kind of catchy because as Germany degenerates and everything is bombed to the ground. Also, Hitler's health kind of is bombed to the ground. Um, so he's kind of in sync. You know, his, his his physical condition is in sync with the condition he creates, not only for Germany but actually for the for the for, for the whole of Europe. And talk about some of his erratic behavior and how it starts to map onto his addiction. I'm not sure if we can call his behavior erratic because it was very focused on his belief. So he doesn't really change 
in a way. I mean, it becomes erratic because the world changes, but he doesn't change. So his decisions seem erratic, but he he takes the drugs to keep his tunnel vision and to just stay on track, like never change, you know, because he's not flexible in his mind. And this is what cost Germany the war, because, you know, if you have a commander who's not flexible in his thinking, you have a problem because the war situation on the ground is extremely fluid and you you know you know you need to think basically out of the box the whole time but national socialism is not a belief system that is creative it's a very you know rigid system so um hitler used these drugs in a way that were it was coherent with nazi ideology for him because he could stay on track but it also destroyed National Socialism because it just proved to be a system that cannot really function in a, in a fluid, evolving world. And we all know how the story ends for Hitler. Um, what is the role of sort of drugs and the central thesis of Pervitin in German society? How does that storyline continue after 945? I mentioned this before, Pervitin was still around in the 50s, but um, it didn't influence society as much anymore as it did in the 40s. I mean, it takes quite an effort to rebuild a country, and there's reports uh, on Japan, for example, that methamphetamine, which was also used in Japan, uh, was was being used to rebuild the country that had been nuked to the ground and also the German so-called debris women who cleared up all the debris in the bombed out cities in Germany apparently used pavitine so they could you know master the task but the 50s in Germany was not really uh, shaped by methamphetamine Outside of Germany and Japan, did you discover in your research or learn any interesting anecdotes about uh, the role of drugs in other countries and armies of the same period? There was an article in an Italian newspaper in September 1940 talking about a courage pill that the Germans are taking. Basically, this was the, someone spilled a military secret uh, because obviously the British uh, became interested in that and uh, made their own tests then and found out that meth is actually too strong for the British soldier because obviously a British soldier cannot take as much as a German soldier. Um, but British soldier can still take amphetamine, so they decided to stockpile uh, amphetamine, benzedrine, basically. Uh, but they learned, so they learned from the Nazis that you could take a stimulant to improve your fighting capabilities. So when Montgomery was fighting Rommel in the desert in late 40 and 41, the British were on amphetamines and the Germans were on methamphetamine. And the Western armies, especially the American army, was using amphetamines. Then in the Korean War, in the Vietnam War, also in the Iraq War of the early 90s. So the Nazis' legacy continues. Is there any particular lesson you want the people who read this book to uh, leave with? It's very dangerous if a government becomes um, the driving force in organizing what drugs should be taken or what drugs are not to be taken by you know individuals because the government usually does not is not concerned even though it might claim otherwise with the health 
benefits uh, of the people who live in a certain area, but more with other things, ideologies or a certain, you know, basically it's an ideology. So I think that drug laws um, are quite violent and do not correspond to a free society. I think governments abuse drug laws to control people. In America, this is very obvious with controlling minorities like the African Americans through the drug laws. So, um, and the Nazis did that, you know, use drugs in a massive way to shape the society to their view, to their needs and to their, you know, liking. That's why I think um, that governments have no right to actually um, create drug laws. Uh, obviously, they have a duty to protect citizens from harmful practices, maybe. Um, but since we have seen that the war on drugs does not prohibit people from taking drugs, but rather creates dangerous drugs because the drugs are no longer... Um, are no longer controlled by, you know, authorities that would, you know, look at the purity. Like heroin was a German product. It was, you know, looked at. There was no one died of heroin when it was, you know, you buy, you get it from Bayer. You have it uh, in combination with your doctor's advice. People didn't die from it. But if you take heroin now, you go on the street corner and buy heroin. You might die from it because you don't know what the hell you're taking. So I guess the lesson is that uh, drugs should all be legalized eventually you know there should be a discussion in society and this discussion is already going on i mean in america at least marijuana is now being legalized in many states psilocybin is becoming legalized so at least drugs that are not harmful like psychedelics should obviously be legalized cocaine you think that should be legalized too I had a reading in Peru and when I landed at the airport the first thing that I was given was a was a coca tea at the airport and this coca tea was actually quite good I and mean, it was just coca leaves in hot water uh, and if you bring like coca leaves to the United States a bag of coca leaves you probably get like 20 years in prison or something um, Obviously, cocaine, as we know it, is a horrible drug. And uh, but then again, when it was still legal, uh, you know, Freud developed psychoanalysis on cocaine. So the cocaine that you get on the black market is bullshit. You know, it's like I don't know, it's poisoned with all kinds of stuff. I mean, cocaine itself is also a ridiculous substance because it's. But also refined sugar is a ridiculous substance. Uh, so I, I think we need to look totally, di have a different uh, look on drugs and stimulants and uh, eventually, obviously, uh, coca leaves and cocaine sh should also be legal. If we know what it is and, you know, I don't think more people would take it. Probably less people would take it. And it would be, you know, pure and whatever, you know. Cocaine, it's in itself is not is not the problem. What about the problem of addiction? I mean, we're all addicted to something, you know. I, I, the, the, I, I'm not really an expert on addiction, but I, I guess the concept of addiction also is totally old fashioned. What is addiction? When is addiction bad? What is just consumption? What is have behavior? I don't physical know. Physical withdrawals. Because I, I, I think, um, you know, the, 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 the discussion of whether drugs should be legalized or not um, is like so important and interesting and worthwhile because everyone does it or a lot of people do it. The question is, are you going to try and, you know, punish it and then keep it sort of underground um, in the dark or do you bring it to the surface and then maybe have deal with the problems there I, I think it's a you know obviously like one of the most yeah nonetheless 
I'm at abs- I'm at an absolute loss for words today. My apologies, Norman. Usually, <laughs> don't, okay. I'm usually not this. I'm rambly, also getting a I little promise. bit. I'm getting a little bit tired. But, but um, okay, if you saw. Yeah, yeah. Okay, then let's then let's wrap it up with a, just two or three more questions. How surprised mm-hmm. were you by the success of the book? I've always been convinced um, that my books are basically uh, a blessing to the world, um, which is obviously ridiculous. But uh, this is, you know, my, <laughs> this was my belief already when I'm I was twenty. That. When I was writing, <laughs> I was I was already I was always convinced that my books would be interesting. So for me, that my fourth book became a big success was not you know surprising actually because i always thought my books are successful um and while i was researching um i it was clear to me that the story is very very interesting obviously so you can write an excellent book you can write an excellent book on something that is not really so interesting to so many people and it might not be a big success but if you write an excellent book on such a juicy topic, your chances are much higher that it becomes a big success. But it's still not, you know, it could still have been an, it could still be an underground book that no one really knows about. I don't actually think so because it's really a, I don't know, the book is just, it's, it's just a good project. I don't know. It, I'm not surprised <laughs> it's successful, actually. I would be surprised if it's not successful. It I would be sad and surprised. I have, I don't know. I mean, it's not such a huge success, but it's out in over 30 languages and it was a New York Times bestseller and bestseller in Germany and some other countries. I don't know, maybe a million. Amazing. I mean, that's a huge success. That's a lot. By yeah. publishing standards. Yeah, a like that's, a, that's a complete outlier success. Um, I wonder, did you see that Lex Friedman actually brought you up by name recently? in his podcast. Are you familiar with who that is? No. Lex Friedman is an American podcaster. Um, he probably has top five most listened to podcasts in the world. Um, and I forget the context. I should be better, but he was ha- talking to a guest and he's fascinated in the history of world war two. Um, you know, has reread rise and fall of the third Reich multiple times and uh, actually brought you up by name and was asking his guests whether he should try and have you on. Um, I just wonder if, if you'd seen that. It, it would probably be the single biggest piece of promotion you could ever do. Hmm. No, maybe I should contact him. But it would also be very interesting because um, he's a great interviewer and he would uh, he treat you well. <laughs> He'd fly you over to America and, you know, you'd... You wouldn't have to talk to him through a computer like you are with me. Okay, Norman. So final two questions for you, mate. I try to ask this to every guest who comes on the show. The first being, could you talk about the role that serendipity played in your life? Well, I kind of organize my life according to this principle or I, I allow this principle to lead me because I probably also believe or experience karm, karmic situations. Or are you asking for a particular instance or, I mean, in general, I would just say it's important, but again, I'm a little bit tired. So. <laughs> okay. Well, I mean, you, you, you gave a great example earlier about how the subject of your most popular book of all time happened by a, having a conversation with a DJ in a nightclub in Berlin. That's a beautiful moment of serendipity. I think you just sort of said it yourself. Um, you organize your life by it. You believe in some type of karmic principle and therefore, you know, one optimizes by keeping their mind open, by not saying no to people, by yeah. um, just... Yeah, keeping an open mind at the end of the day, like what what could possibly happen here if I just, you know, go down this path? And you never know what yeah. it leads to. Maybe yeah. it leads to a best selling yeah. book. Maybe it leads to uh years wasted. Who yeah. knows? But not all serendipity is yeah. good, I suppose yeah. is worthwhile saying as well. But 
Interesting. Yeah. Okay, well, uh, final question then, Norman. If you could witness a conversation between any two people of history, dead or alive, no language barrier, so listening to a podcast, who would the two people be? That's a hard question. Maybe Jesus and Mary Magdalene, or whatever her name was, the girlfriend of Jesus. I don't know. There's too many that I'm interested in. Nice. Well, Jesus and Mary. We'll talk about whether they ended up having kids. <laughs> Jesus and Mary. And created yeah, right. the uh, created the the bloodline. <laughs> well, it all everything all roads lead Dan Brown Da Vinci Code. Yeah, right. <laughs> okay, Norman. Um, anything else? Um. Well, I think we should do another one on my new book when it comes out in America. <laughs> All right, we shall.